Hi, this is Shauna, the CEO and founder of Fuel Talent. One of the things I have loved most in my 25-year recruiting career has always been the stories that people tell. Stories of leadership, career choices, company ideas, and team building. My inspiration for starting the What Fuels You podcast came from being curious about people's lives and wanting to help share their stories. What path brought them to this place? What decisions did they make that led to failures and successes? Who influenced those decisions and what lessons were learned along the way? I hope you enjoy the What Fuels You podcast. Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is Scott Ferris. Scott is the CEO of Attunely, a proven, compliant, and trustworthy machine learning platform that makes the recovery of receivables easy, seamless, and profitable. Attunley has earned recognition as one of the best places to work in Seattle, number 29 of 50 best paying companies, and number 7 of 50 best small companies to work for. Scott brings over 30 years of technology executive management experience in both domestic and international markets. Scott's career spans decades of technology innovation with companies such as U.S. West, Starbucks, Vindaria, Aquaniv, and Microsoft. Scott holds a BA degree in marketing from American Intercontinental University, and uh, I'm just really excited to have you. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, Sean. It's beautiful. It's great to be here, and I look forward to the discussion. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to hear where you're from because for some reason I hear a little like New York accent. New York. But yes, that, New York. Okay. Good. Because I lived there for many years, and my husband's from there, so I pick up on it, and I miss it so much. So this is extra. Extra fun. I get to hear a little New York. If I had known that, I would have probably added some rapid fire questions. Um, maybe I'll add one in. Okay. Well, go for it. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, you ready? You know, you know what they say. You know what they say. You could take the boy out of New York City, but you can't take New York City out of the boy. Yeah, no, I get it completely. I was only there for 13 years and it's definitely in me. So I get it. Um, okay, given you worked at Starbucks in two different uh, segments within your career, I'm curious what your favorite morning drink is. Oh, it's a uh, tall vanilla uh, latte. Oh tall yeah, that's very latte, similar which, to mine. Yes, and I, you know, obviously got the pleasure of being able to make that myself every morning uh, in the Starbucks uh, support center. So yeah, now I have to pay. Now I, I have to pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> yeah. Are you city, mountains, or beach? I, believe it or not, I'm all three. Uh, I live in downtown Bellevue. Um, I used to live in, in the mountains in, uh, I'd say, uh, Cougar Mountain. Uh, and I also have a place in Mexico. So I'm by the beach in Carolina. Oh, wait, so. we need to talk about that. That's like my dream long-term. Oh, Mexico. Wow. Okay, we're yeah, going to get so into that. Um, sounds good. What is the best business book that you've ever read? Oh my gosh. Um, I would say, uh, crossing the chasm. Um, that, I've that never to me heard was, that one. yeah, it's, um, you know, it's a book about startups and, and the growth in startups. Um, it was a long time ago and, uh, you know, I, I unfortunately don't have, uh, the time to read these days, you know, obviously doing a startup is very difficult, uh, to, to find the time and, and also enjoy my hobbies, which uh, take up a lot of time. And obviously with COVID, it's, uh, it makes it difficult to do both. So, yeah, I get that. What are three words that would describe you as a friend? Uh, loyal, I would say, um, fun and, um, serious. Nice. A combo, a combo meal, fun and serious. I like it. Um, how do you take your bagel? How do I take my bagel? Uh, yeah. I would say with chive cream cheese and uh, cold smoked salmon, capers oh. and onions. We just had that on Saturday. I don't like it that way at all. I'm just like straight up butter or butter and jam um, or cream cheese, not, but not I can't deal with all the salty. Not the same yeah. type of uh, not the same type of bagels here in the in the Pacific Northwest as in the Northeast. Oh, I know. We we sometimes fly ours in or definitely bring them back when we come back from New York. So I completely get it. Are you more spontaneous or do you like more kind of planning and stability? Spontaneous, definitely spontaneous. And 
here's my final question on the rapid fire. Um, what are you impressed by or what, what types of things impress you? I would say what impresses me is um, people who are very successful, um, who either have a lot of richness in their life or in their finances and are very humble. Uh, actually, this is a lot of what I really enjoy about the Pacific Northwest is uh, people are very, very humble, regardless of their stature and what they've accomplished educationally, financially, uh, and personally. And that that, that impresses yeah. me all the time. My husband, who's also a New Yorker, said the same thing when we moved here. We ran into somebody who I knew, um, you know, had been mega successful and he was driving like a Subaru Outback, like very Northwest. And it's so common, like it's almost the, the anti-money it's, be, it's changed a lot. Um, yeah, obviously. But it's true. It's much different than New York in that way where people could be living in, you know, a third story walk up in Queens, but they've got like a five carat diamond. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what I noticed. Yeah. None of it really yeah. adds up. It's more the flash. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So tell me about your childhood. You're from New York City? Uh, I'm actually from Long Island, uh, uh, Brooklyn and Long Island. Uh, my parent, Both my parents... Um, uh, grew up in New York, uh, came from New York, uh, both uneducated. Uh, so I am the classic example of somebody who had to put myself through school, and and obviously school was a was a, a you know a challenge for me both financially and academically. Uh, so I had a you know very uh, arduous sort of journey with school, but I, I persevered, and you know came from a lower middle income family. Uh, that, uh, you know, lived in a small house. I have two sisters, an older and a younger sister. So uh, I think uh, I'm the kind of proverbial metrosexual who is very sensitive um, and really just always wanted to break out um, and, you know, didn't want to live the life that is typical in the Northeast where uh, you live and you stay in New York and you, you try to you know, get a great job. And if you're going to get a great job and have a good life, you're going to be in the suburbs and then you're commuting an hour plus to, to get to uh, uh, the Big Apple, so to speak. And, and um, you know, eventually I, I did get a job out of college. I was working uh, in the uh, telecommunications field and uh, met a gentleman, worked for a company called Continental uh, Telephone Company based out of New Haven, Connecticut, who had a, an office in New York City. I met a gentleman there who eventually became an executive at U.S. West and moved all the way out to Denver, Colorado. And I stayed in touch with him and he called me up one day and said, hey, I have an opening uh, for a, a sales kind of manager type role in Phoenix, Arizona. Would you be interested? And I jumped at the chance uh, and I flew from New York to to Phoenix, Arizona in February. At the time, I was living Perfect in a timing. very small. Yeah, I lived in a very small apartment. And when I looked at uh, what I could earn as a sales manager in Phoenix, Arizona, I could have a, a home with a pool and a jacuzzi for the amount of money I was spending on a studio apartment in Manhattan. And it was yeah. a no brainer, a no brainer. And I moved out west. And you and you haven't gone back. So we're, we're I, lucky. I have not, I have not turned back. I haven't turned back. Yeah. So. What do you think that when you were younger, um, you know, did you have mentors or heroes or people that were your kind of North Star since you felt like your parents were probably not guiding you toward your destiny. Yeah, I had uh, a dear friend of mine who I grew up with, his older brother. So I was almost like a pseudo brother to him. Obviously, I didn't have an older brother. I had an older sister. Um, so I gravitated to, uh, you know, my dear friend's older brother uh, and kind of attached myself uh, very, very closely to him. And, you know, he became somewhat of a mentor to me over the years. And, you know, I still stay in contact with him today. Yeah. And was education um, kind of a value in the family, like how some parents are like, hey, I didn't get an education or formal education. And so to give more to the next generation, like that's the most important thing. Yeah, unfortunately, it wasn't. Um, and, you know, my parents didn't really give me much guidance as it related to education. So it was all self you know, sort of initiated. Um, and, yeah. you know, obviously my friends, we all went, you know, I initially uh, started in, in uh, the State University of New York uh, system and then finished my degree with, uh, you know, with um, American Intercontinental University. And 
It was hard. You how know, did you hard How did to... you find out about How did you find out about American Intercontinental University and and what was that experience like? Yeah, so it was mostly because I was uh, moving on in my job, and uh, I I was in London. I spent a lot of time in London, so I had had this opportunity, and uh, I left school before I, I got my degree. And then I, I finished my degree in, uh, through London because they had a, um, a, a location and a campus in London. Uh, so for me, it was a case of, of, you know, I just had to finish my degree and I wanted to, uh, to do that uh, and work at the same time because obviously I was putting myself through school. So they, they were just a, a good connection because I was an American ex, expat in London and I felt comfortable with uh, an American university that had a campus in London. Yeah. And so you studied marketing. Perseverance. Yeah, marketing, that's awesome. Yeah. And so, so you studied marketing and you were working, it sounds like in sales. Is well, actually right? at that point, uh, I was still with us yeah. West and uh, I had completed my sort of stint, let's say in, in the sales uh, department in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, through, like, obviously through a large com- company like that, I met a lot of different people and I got a call from somebody out of Denver, Colorado, who I developed a relationship with, who said, you know, we are beginning to, to put a planning team together uh, to plan uh, an, an investment in the United Kingdom to build an integrated communications company and partnering with a cable company. Uh, would you be interested in, in participating on the planning team? So I did that remotely from Phoenix. And then eventually uh, they made the investment. This was at a time in the late eighties when the UK government was uh, going through a duopoly review and they wanted to engender investment by U S cable companies and U S telephone companies to build integrated cable and telecommunication networks to compete with British telecom. So we were a part of a planning team. We eventually uh, d- decided to make a, dis- uh, to make an investment in 13 different franchises with, at the time, TCI, Comcast, and other cable companies. And then I was uh, given the unbelievable opportunity to, to move to London and execute against that plan. So I moved from wow. Phoenix, Arizona. I moved from Phoenix, Arizona to London. I was the one of the first few expatriate employees of US West, which was the regional bell operating company here in the West, uh, yeah. to move to London. And I lived in London. And what, a, what an exciting time! Wouldn't sorry to interrupt you, but what what an exciting time, Scott, to be in that industry. I mean, that was kind of the pinnacle time in telecom. Yeah, it was, po- it was post divestiture. All the tel- regional bell operating companies were trying to figure out how they di- diversify. U.S. West was quite aggressive, both on mobile and on broadband. So, you know, what I did in the UK was built the first digital broadband cable system that integrated cable telephone ser- telephone service, cable television service, and at that time, dial-up, so data. So yeah. we pioneered, wow. you know, this was 19, 1988, 89. Yeah. So it was, uh, wow. and living in the United Kingdom was unbelievable. You know, I was an expatriate. It was like uh, having the rich parents I never had uh, in terms of just paying for everything. We were there during desert storms. So it was, you know, a bit of a scary time, but just a wonderful experience. You know, I lived there four years with my my wife at the time and we had no children and we traveled the world. I mean, it was. Yeah, that sounds like a blast. Something. Yeah. You got the Mexico thing. You got the London thing. Two experiences that I admire. That's that's amazing. And so you were there 14 years. That's a long time. At US right? West, yeah. About 14 yeah. years, yes. And did you have varied roles? It sounds like in the beginning stage you had a few. Did it continue on and did you get to kind of try your hand at many different areas of the business? Yeah. So I started in sales, which was great to learn, you know, how a business operates and to follow a customer and make sure a customer is satisfied through all the different functions of the business. I then moved into uh, business development, uh, which is the classic business development about partnerships and things of that nature. And then I moved into marketing. Um, And that's when I got the call to participate on on the planning team. And then once I moved to the United Kingdom, I was sort of a general manager. Um, I worked with, uh, you know, British counterparts uh, who were representing 
uh, the franchises that were being invested by the North American telephone and cable companies, because part of the regulation was you had to hire local nationals. So mm. that was an unbelievable experience because I was working obviously multi-functions, but I had to work with, you know, British counterparts uh, and really knowledge transfer what we had done in the United States with telecommunications, working with a counterpart on the cable side of the business who were knowledge transferring the cable side of the business to a British counterpart with the cultural divide that, you know, would exist between yeah. the U.S. And, and England. How did you end up at Starbucks after that? Seattle. Did you come to Seattle? Yeah. So so here's what happened. So, uh, you know, I was in the United Kingdom. uh, So I was at at U.S. West for 14 years. The first nine years I was in, you know, sort of New York and then Phoenix. Then I moved to London for four years. And then I was repatriated back to Denver, Colorado. So my assignment was over. I came back and moved to Denver, Colorado. I had two, two children at the time. And um, I was part of a a planning committee because we were taking the strategy from the United Kingdom and bringing it to the U.S. So what you see today with, you know, the triple play and integration of telephone service and cable and high speed data is what we did uh, in the United Kingdom and pioneered in 1988, 1989. So when I repatriated to Denver, uh, the the company made it uh, U.S. West acquired a very small cluster of cable systems in Atlanta. Uh, it was uh, privately owned called Wameco Georgia Cable. Eventually, U.S. West became a big acquirer of all the cable companies here in the U.S. Uh, we acquired the third largest cable company called Continental Cable Vision based out of Boston. So we, through $18, $19 billion of transactions, we came up with uh, a new cable company for the U.S. that would integrate these communication uh, and entertainment services. And I was in charge of marketing uh, at the time, and I rebranded the company Media One. So we took all of these assets, we incorporated into Media One. And at that time, we were trying to figure out how do you sort of deploy high-speed data to the U.S. market? Do you lease equipment to consumers, or do you allow the retail organizations like Radio Shack and Best Buy and others actually sell cable modems like they do today? So I was part of a planning committee in the industry, and I was charged with finding somebody to come speak at the in, to, to the industry about retail. So I had Mickey Drexler on the list. I had Howard Schultz on the list. I had all these people on the list. I broke through Howard Schultz's office. I was able to get on the phone with him. As, and as you know, he's from New York. Uh, he's from you know similar area. He's from Brooklyn. And I connected with him and he agreed to come and speak to the industry. And then I took him out to lunch afterwards and uh, just to express my appreciation. And about two weeks later, he called me up and said, hey, I'm looking for somebody who understands technology, who understands, uh, you know, entertainment uh, to come in and help me figure out the Internet for Starbucks. Would you be interested in interviewing? And I I flew out from Denver to Seattle and met with Howard and his leadership team and the rest is history. Uh, Wow. That's a great story. That's an awesome story. Not many people get into Starbucks uh, through that channel. And it sounds like from what I've heard, he's quite the closer and he kind of got you to come take this role. How was that experience? Captivating. I mean, he is an infectious personality. Uh, You know, he's, incredibly energetic. He's, uh, you know, the consummate entrepreneur and and visionary. And think about this, you know, Starbucks at the time uh, saw the internet as an, as a new distribution vehicle for building a whole new business, you know, using the footprint of Starbucks as a way to drive traffic to the internet. Now think about this. This was the internet where e-commerce was first coming up. And the biggest issue with e-commerce was attracting eyeballs and getting people to your site. And Howard had a grand vision. You know, he was about, you know, taking the third place experience and putting it online. So how do you take the experience of Starbucks where it's community, it's music, it's even the furniture in the store. And how do you bring that to life in the e-commerce, e-retail environment and then use use the physical bricks and mortar uh, locations of Starbucks to drive people to the Internet? What a phenomenal opportunity, right? You know, for for me to, you know, if I was going to leave enterprise and I was going to go anywhere on the internet and try to make a run at the internet, 
what better way to do that than to work with somebody like Howard with the brand umbrella of Starbucks. And, you know, we were going down Silicon Valley. We were looking to spin out a company and, you know, bring it public. So I had the whole experience and exposure to, you know, venture capital and, and working with Howard was uh, an amazing experience because obviously he was very vested in the, in the vision and the strategy. So it was great. It was a great experience. Yeah. And so you were there just a couple of years. What, what made you leave? A lot of people just kind of stay, especially because, you know, you had the ear of the CEO. How come you left there? Yeah. Well, it's the classic story. I had done enterprise my whole life. Uh, I saw the internet as a whole new frontier. Uh, I obviously had, you know, the, the stars in my eyes about, you know, becoming, you know, my own entrepreneur and being independently wealthy. And I said, I'm going to go do my own thing. And I created a company called Vendaria, which was taking video and almost creating a video end cap in an e-retail environment. So we, we built streaming video that were like product infomercials. Um, we would sell it into manufacturers of product who wanted to represent their product on an e-retail site. Uh, and we would host it through uh, JavaScript code. And, you know, when you get to an e-retail page, you see a watch video button that would give you a 30 second, 60 second video of what that product is. And, you know, that's, that was what Vendaria was. And we had a great product. We had great technology and we were off like gangbusters. And then we hit the internet crash. Uh, and, you know, capital dried up and, you know, I had grown the company probably to 30, 40 people. Uh, then I had to wind it all down. Um, obviously I put a lot of my own money. I, I didn't take salary for a good year and a half, you know, went through the classic sort of boom and bust experience on the internet. And eventually, uh, from there, I was, uh, you know, just meeting a lot of people in the Seattle tech community. And I met uh, one of the co-founders of Aquantive, uh, who uh, we hit it off. And, and he said, you know, we're looking for somebody who really understands content and understands technology. Would you come join, you know, the, the founding team of, of Aquantive? And I eventually did that. And then obviously we went through a, a boom and a bust there, uh, but then rebuilt the company and uh, had a very successful exit uh, where we sold to Microsoft yeah. in 2007. So. Yeah, that was a very successful outcome. And what a cool experience to be on that rocket ship, right? Some incredible yeah. uh, ex executives and entrepreneurs came out of that company. Oh, yes. Um, and a very unique culture. It was a great culture, great people, very, very, um, you know, humanistic uh, type culture uh, in terms of it's about the relationships. It's about the trust and the people and and it was a great experience and we, we had hard times uh, and then we had great times and, and uh, you know, we all sort of integrated into Microsoft and at the time, uh, you know, they created a whole division for, for the management team of Aquantive and, you know, the early days, it was great. It was a great experience. Yeah. But then, that must have been an adjustment uh, going to Microsoft. How would you describe that acquisition experience and just kind of going back to such a big company? Well, I was obviously comfortable uh, in a large enterprise environment. Um, we were, you know, at the time when we were integrated into Microsoft, uh, it was a diff a, there was a different scenario because uh, we were promised to be uh, independent. Uh, they created Microsoft advertising. And at the time, Brian McAndrews, who was the CEO of Aquantive, became the leader of Microsoft advertising. So his whole management and executive team was intact. And we just lifted and shifted over to Microsoft and ran the advertising business. But then they started integrating other engineering leadership into the company. Um, and then uh, Steve Ballmer uh, made a decision. Kevin Johnson had left. Uh, he was the Gone president. Gone back to Starbucks. Uh, yeah. Well, at the time, he went to Juniper Networks as the CEO oh, of Juniper yes. Networks. So Brian, uh, you know, the whole leadership team of Aquanov was very you know, well connected with, with Kevin Johnson. And uh, he, you know, he definitely embraced, you know, keeping the team intact and giving them, you know, autonomy to run Microsoft advertising. And then when he left, um, you know, Steve Ballmer made a choice about who was going to lead this platform services division. Brian McAndrews was a candidate. And then Chi Lu 
was eventually selected. And when that happened, everything changed. Uh, you know, they integrated a lot of people into the team and, you know, the quant of team sort of uh, broke up at that point and everybody went their separate ways. And I ended up staying for uh, a few more years because I was running the consumer advertising monetization for Microsoft advertising. I was working very closely with the Xbox folks who were very entrepreneurial. Obviously, my my video and, and entertainment background was very well suited for that. So I was having a good time. But then over time, I think it was it was more and more difficult for me to stay there. I was hoping for a change. You know, I had worked with um, Satya Nadella because he was running the engineering team at Bing. I, you know, it's worked with him. And uh, once he was announced as the new CEO, then I, I you know, I had renewed uh, interest. But uh, at the time, I then got a call from Kevin Johnson from Starbucks. Kevin and Howard called me. Uh, they were working on mobile order and pay. Um, and said, hey, come in here. We want to talk to you about, uh, you know, something we we're, we're doing here at Starbucks. And it was just a good time for me to say, look, I, I probably had enough of Microsoft. And I went over to Starbucks and uh, worked with um, with um, Adam Brotman, who was the chief digital yeah. officer there. I just had Adam on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. Oh, you did? Yeah, Adam's great. I'm sure Adam shared with you that that it was a challenge uh, to build a platform like that within a large enterprise that frankly had not yet ported their technology over to the cloud or, or microservices. And so there was a lot going on at Starbucks at the time. And, um, you know, I had, you know, a good second experience, obviously. I really have great respect for, for Kevin and, and Howard before he left. And, and uh, you know, it, it's just, it's hard to work in an organization and innovate in an organization that's trying to, redefine their technology back end at the same time. Yeah. And, uh, and I understand, I do understand that, but I, I will say, I think Starbucks has done a phenomenal job um, at least on the order technology, like kind of first to move there and um, the ease. I mean, there's obviously some tweaks and I, I want to tell someone every day, but generally speaking, it really um, increases my quality of life as far as speed. Absolutely. And, and, you know, they were a leader in mobile order and pay for sure. And they yeah. do great things because they, they still have an innovation spirit. Uh, but obviously, as a global enterprise, you know, there's a lot of uh, interconnected tissue that, that exists in the technology back end. So if you want to really create and innovate, a, uh, you know, a, a new front end, particularly mobile, uh, it's dependent on the back end. So it's a matter of synchronizing front end and back end technology. And, and, and that's, that's a challenge, uh, clearly a challenge in any enterprise. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm just listening to you and you've got such a diverse, um, kind of eclectic background. I mean, there's a consistency in that there's technology, but so many different sectors and to become a knowledge expert in so many um, creates so much value for whoever it is that was going to kind of get to work with you next. And so, Going to Pioneer Square Labs, totally different experience. Did you look at various labs or labs models, or did you just know that PSL was the right place for you? Yeah. So, you know, Mike Galgett is a co-founder of Pioneer Square Labs. He also is the co-founder of Aquantive. So he and I worked very closely together for many, many years. Uh, he knew, obviously, I was over at Starbucks, and when PSL came across the credit ecosystem, as you know, as they commonly do, they they look at different sectors, different industries, and categories. Once they came across the credit ecosystem, I got the call from Mike, who said, "Hey, I want you to come in here and listen to what we're uh, you know learning about this credit ecosystem in a segment called debt collection, because uh, it reminded him of the early days of us building out Atlas. You know, we built Atlas as a as a platform to help." these independent media agencies, you know, plan media and place media on the internet, in, internet for their clients. And there was a lot of pattern recognition that he was having in this credit ecosystem. So he called me up, I came in, I met with him and a uh, business analyst at the time, and I was captivated. And, you know, Mike and I, you know, we've worked so closely together for so many years, we got up to the whiteboard and, uh, and, you know, 
I, I walked out of there and I was like, wow, this is very interesting. You know, this is sort of like what we did early days of the internet, but it's a $450 billion a year debt sort of market. And, you know, I got the bug again and I, you know, I stayed at Starbucks for a little bit longer, but then eventually I, I went into Kevin Johnson and I said, Hey, look, he knows Mike, um, he knew of Pioneer you got, Square. You got, you got the bug. And so the how, bug. For, for, for those people who don't understand the labs model, um, you know, do you just come in and, you know, when you're entrepreneur in residence, is that why you, while you're kind of beta testing the idea and working with different, um, you know, product managers and engineers to try to test it? Um, and then some get spun out. Is that is that an accurate kind of summary? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. The best way to think about it is they have a staff of subject subject matter experts across different functions, and they either work with entrepreneurs who who are trusted, who they have past relationships with and past experiences with, and bring them in to help ideate uh, new business concepts, or the entrepreneur actually walks in the door with a new idea. And I was the former, not the latter, and and then. You know, if the entrepreneur and the, let's say, management director, uh, managing director who, who is on the case agrees that this is worthy of, of more time and energy, they allocate resources at PSL, and then the entrepreneur comes in as an enterprise uh, entrepreneur in residence. And, you know, we worked, I, I decided to do that. I wanted to get the blessing of, of Kevin Johnson and Howard, uh, which I did. They were wonderful, and they understood that worked out a transition, came in and incubated in uh, Pioneer Square Labs, working with Mike Galgan, working with people on the staff. And eventually we spun out a Thule in January of 2018. Yeah. And so do you have um, co-founders and what exactly is the business model? Yeah. So interestingly enough, I spun out, I was the founder uh, and then soon thereafter, the uh, chief technology officer of Pioneer Square Labs and the business analyst that was working on the case, um, Ryan, Ryan Kosai and Trip Edwards, uh, they approached me and said, hey, we're compelled uh, by this opportunity and we've been impressed, you know, in terms of working with you. Uh, we'd love to come join you. And I, I agreed to do that with the, obviously the blessing of Pioneer Square Labs. So they were very early. Uh, working with me on on the spin out, and you know the business model is uh, a, a SaaS platform, but we're really machine learning as uh, you know the the technology that are helping debt collection agencies, debt buyers, as well as financial institutions, fintechs, and credit unions, and and others on improving the debtor experience. Basically, you know today the way Debt collection works is, you know, from day one of default to day 90 of default, a financial institution or fintech will try to work with a consumer to bring them back in good stead and be, bring them back on their payments. But once they reach the financial policy of charge off for that particular financial institution, uh, typically is 90 days or 120 days, they charge off that consumer and then they send it to the third party collection agencies who work on a contingency basis. And they all they do is send a letter, make a phone call, send a letter and continue to work that until they connect with a consumer and try to recover on that revenue. It's not the greatest experience um, because you know they're obviously working on uh, older technology. They're only using actual outbound dialing and, and actual, believe it or not, hardcore letters uh, that they're sending. Obviously, you know, consumers have evolved in terms of their communication modality preferences. And what we have decided to do was to start in the third party collection space first and actually do that without having to use PII. So if you go back to the Internet days, you know, what we did well with Atlas was we took the anonymous cookie. It became a proxy of the behavior of a consumer on the Internet. And that was used as a way to segment consumers and target ads to consumers based on their likes, dislikes, hobbies, and behaviors. So we took the same set of principles in digital advertising and we applied it to post charge off delinquency for consumers who are you know, delinquent on, on a payment. And it's really about bringing personalization to that experience 
that will allow the debt collection companies as well as financial institutions and anybody who has a recurring revenue stream with a consumer to treat that consumer uh, with a, a, a little more um, personalization and really, frankly, don't spend time on people who don't have a propensity to pay or have mm -hmm. a wherewithal to pay. Only spend mm -hmm. time with people who do have a propensity and earnestly want to you know, repay debt or, or retire debt. And you mm -hmm. know, that's going to improve the experience for those people today that are continually contacted, even though they have no way to sort of repay a debt. They lost their job. They don't have any money. They've had a hardship in their life. You know, today it's very difficult for a collection agency or even financial institutions to discern who they should really spend time with and how they mm -hmm. should treat that employee to try to get them back in good stead. And, and how, how do you, how, how do you, is that like through predictive analytics? Like how do you anticipate or um, profile those consumers and how do you even get access to the debt records? Yeah. So what we do is we go to the financial institutions or the collection agencies and we ingest all the historical data that they have on, on consumers without PII, without private. What is you know, PII? Personally oh, private. Oh, personally okay. I was like, do I, should I know PII? Okay. Yeah. Got so we're, we're trying to take those principles in the digital ad space. So, you know, good example is you're on your, you're on your, you know, browser surfing the internet. You have a cookie in your browser. That's an anonymous cookie. When you hit a website, uh, there's a, an ad server that's looking up your cookie and looking back on what sites you've surfed over the last 30, 60 days. So it's, that's so creepy, <laughs> but it, it's the way the internet has worked for 25 years. It's the reality. Years. I get it. It's how, you know, you get great personalization. Yeah, so it's why you get great, you know, product recommendations from Amazon, right? It's based on what your surfing behavior has yeah. been. Obviously, they have more registration data on you, but in the in the general sort of internet context where you have an anonymous cookie, it becomes a very strong signal as to your behaviors, your likes, your dislikes, your yeah. tendencies. And what we're doing is we're taking that de-identified data off of the servers. Uh, where collection agencies and financial institutions store that data on what they have done to try to contact you and interact with you to recover on that revenue and to try to collect on that debt. And we're taking all of those signals de-identified. We're taking all the debt records. You know, what is the, the, the debt of value? What's the age of the debt? Um, who's the originating creditor? All of that information as well, but no PII, so de-identified. We're, we're putting it into a container in the cloud, and then we're training a, a machine learning model to learn as to what has worked and what hasn't worked in trying to interact with this particular debtor. And then we overlay it with economic, economic data like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, Federal Reserve uh, Supply of wow. Money, I, IRS data, and it, it start, sort of paints a, an opaque picture of a de-identified consumer who behaves in delinquency across a number of different asset classes, whether it's consumer debt, student loan debt, real estate, um, medical debt. And wow. it, it allows... It, there's so much data, Scott. Like how, I mean, that, that sounds like a whole lot of data to ingest and to sort. <laughs> yes, it's terabytes, terabytes of data. Yeah, and this yeah. is why this, this could only be done at scale, you know, in the cloud, uh, with with using the latest uh, machine learning techniques and data science models. Yeah. And so how did you come up with the name Attunely? Or how did yeah, they come so up with it? Or whoever came up with it? No, I came up with it. You know, I've created uh, a number of brands in my career. Media One was one. Uh, I rebranded Atlas. Uh, I came up with Vendaria. Uh, so this was a, another classic, you know, brand marketing exercise. Obviously, the biggest challenge is can you get the URL? Um, exactly. So, so what we did come up with was a tune. That was the initial sort of uh, brand name we came up with, but we could not get the URL. Um, so I scoured the internet and lo and behold, came across a company that was uh, defunct uh, called Attunely. Uh, we acquired the URL and then we went ahead and secured all of you know, the extensions, you know, .ai, .ai. .io, yeah. 
Oh, nice. You know, everything, nice. Everything is friendly. And then we kind yeah. of wrap the brand around it. Got it. And how did you go about um, fundraising and where are you in that whole process? Yeah. So we just recently uh, closed the series A that was preempted and oversubscribed. So I'm happy to, to report that even in you know the environment that we're, we're facing here, we were successful in securing a round. It was $9.4 million. We just, just closed it probably uh, three months ago. Um, yeah. And who funded would, the company? So a, uh, a venture capital firm out of Toronto, Canada, uh, backed by uh, large financial institutions in Canada. So it's a, com- a company called Framework Venture Partners. Uh, they're a very reputable fintech and uh, machine learning AI investor. Uh, they have the Royal Bank of Canada, Business Development Bank of Canada, JP Morgan Chase. Uh, those are their LPs. So totally understand the fintech space and financial institutions. Uh, wow. We also had, and that's uh, amazing. We also had another new firm, Digital Garage, uh, out of Silicon Valley, who's based out of Japan. Very, very large fintech investor as well. Um, and, you know, I would say fundraising was not easy uh, when I spun out of Pioneer Square Labs. You know, when you think about um, the, the time frame here in, let's say, uh, early 2019, uh, debt collection uh, doesn't, uh, you know, attract a lot of investors, right? You know, when you think about the classic sort of Silicon Valley who... Yeah, it's not uh, so sexy. Right. Yeah. So it it was a challenge. And I would say it took, uh, you know, a lot of conversations to get to a place where, you know, we did find an investor. Our lead investor in the seed round was Anthos Capital out of uh, uh, Santa Monica, California, a large fund. That's how we met. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we've had and they've been great anthos. partners. Yeah, yeah, they've been they're great, great partners and great partners. Yeah. Uh, and for those so, people you know, who are maybe entrepreneurs listening who don't know even where to begin to go try to fundraise, what's that process like? Or, and, and how much guidance do you get from the labs? Well, the labs is very helpful, right? Because all the managing directors at the labs are pre- predominantly venture capital uh, partners. So they, they understand the game of raising capital and they're very, very helpful. You know, so a lot of times I would put the pitch deck together and I'd, I'd, I'd meet in front of, you know, the panel of, uh, MDs at Pioneer Square Labs and they would shoot holes in the, in the pitch and, and give me guidance and coaching on, on pitch. But, you know, at the end of the day, you have to, uh, have a conviction on what you're doing, right? You have to have a very clear vision on the the opportunity the addressable market opportunity and then how uh, what is your mission and how you you're going to sort of build and grow the company and and be very very focused on your differentiation so it's really a case mm-hmm. of a lot of strategic planning um i'd say a lot of startups don't do strategic planning justice you know they tend to work on a lot of um uh you know just general uh, conviction execution and yeah yeah. And so when and you, I, so you've got this, this funding and um, so you're in growth mode and how do you think about culture and growing a business as far as uh, talent acquisition with regard to vetting the proper talent and also attracting the proper talent? Yeah. So we spent a lot of time as a, as a small leadership team, building out the vision and the mission of the company. And then we created a, uh, probably nine different uh, core values uh, that, you know, stem from just uh, humility and balance, uh, you know, having uh, respect and integrity, um, humor, (laughs) like there's, there's a lot of different values that we embrace as a company that is going to be a filter on who we feel can, can fit the culture and join the company. Uh, Because obviously when you're scaling very quickly, as we have in the past, you know, two, three months, uh, it, it's very easy to just uh, find talent and import them into the business and not be too mindful about culture, right? Uh, a lot of companies do pride themselves on culture, but how they uh, adhere to that is, uh, you know, l- less rigorous, I would say. Mm. So yeah. we, we, actually, we actually incorporate that. So when we have a new candidate, we're going to send them uh, our, our vision, mission, and values, and we, we 
we have a pretty arduous uh, kind of recruiting and, and I'll say screening process with, uh, with candidates where uh, they'll typically meet with six to eight different people, um, sometimes two, three on, on one. Uh, and, you know, not only are we screening and interviewing people for their, their core skill set and how they fit to the function, but it's mostly, uh, you know, how do they behave and, and what's yeah. you know, a good cultural ad, not a fit, but a cultural ad. I love, I love that. Uh, the cultural ad is something I've been saying a lot lately because it's, it, it defines it perfectly. And especially in this time, thinking about, you know, diversity initiatives and, and trying to make sure that you have a balanced culture and balanced uh, representation. Um, how are you guys thinking about that? Well, diversity is one of our core values. Uh, we have a statement, all souls are welcomed uh, to, to Attunely. Uh, and we actually embrace a diversity quotient uh, in, in our recruiting. So as an example, if we would use fuel talent, uh, that would be something that we would incorporate into our statement of work is that, you know, you would need to sort of uh, fulfill 20% of the candidate slate with, with diversified you know, candidates, because um, we, mm-hmm. we want, we feel like we can't mandate it, but if we do a good job in filling the top of the funnel, it'll yeah. naturally flow through. Uh, yeah. So it is an important, uh, it is an important value f- for, for Tunely. And I'd say we're doing a fairly decent job of that, including at the board level. We have a, a woman board of directors uh, member as well. So, wow, so we feel that's we're, impressive. On, we're on the right, we're on the right path. Yeah, it sounds like it. And so tell me how the pandemic and this COVID-19 period of time has impacted your business. Yeah, so I was, you know, of the PSL CEOs, I I was an early uh, outlier uh, by taking some uh, immediate action once uh, the pandemic hit, you know, in in earnest um, in March of last year. I, you know, looked at uh, severe cuts to our budget, you know, to kind of preserve cash and, and extend the runway. Uh, I obviously cut everything that was logical, marketing, travel, et cetera. Uh, but then I was looking to cut staff and I eventually went to the organization and I had an all hands meeting and I told them, look, you know, uh, we're faced with this. We, this is a, about survival of the company. And I really would like to keep this team intact. And I would uh, ask each of you to consider uh, taking a salary reduction in lieu of reducing the workforce. Um, and overwhelmingly, everybody agreed to do that. So we all kind of locked arms. We all took a, a pretty severe salary reduction. Um, and we we kind of rode out the storm. And then eventually what happened with us is, you know, we always believed we were counter cyclical as a business. Um, you know, there's always gonna be delinquency. Every, every enterprise on the face of the globe assumes one and a half to 2% net bad debt in their financial uh, kind of statements. And we said, hey, look, you know, let's let's see what this COVID is going to do to delinquencies. And we started doing some analysis and, and we looked back, you know, 20 years to, you know, what's what's happened to, you know, delinquency and debt, you know, in all the different categories, 30, 60, 90 days, 120 days, um, derogatory debt. And what we found was uh, spikes in delinquency at the last recession. You know, so remember we had the mm. housing uh, yes. recession. It was an exorbitant spike in delinquencies. And we, we sort of started drawing a pattern of what happens when there is a recession or high unemployment. And the correlation to, to delinquency is very, very high. So well, I would imagine doing- COVID for sure. Yeah, so we started doing forecasting of what we thought the COVID crisis and the high unemployment rate would do to delinquencies. And it was kind of showing us a picture of a tsunami of delinquencies that is impending. And lo and behold, um, started getting a lot of inbound calls, you know, as people learned about it from venture capital, from large financial institutions. Everybody now, I think, is mindful about what are they going to do when people who have been impacted through you know, unemployment are not able to keep up with their bills and there's lots of delinquencies yeah. and, and all these institutions have reduced their workforce themselves. So what better scenario right. than to have a company like Atuli 
use their machine learning that's very sensitive to the lifetime value of, of a consumer in, in that particular enterprise strategy and, and enable them to use their own technology, use their own call centers, but, but just be smarter about it and, and, right. and do more with less. And, and also the personalization aspect, especially in such a sensitive time around um, kind of just the ethics of what, what even people should do given people's um, just terrible situations and circumstances. Yeah. Um, you know, the thing about um, delinquency is it's both a tremendous threat to the net promoter score and brand equity of an enterprise. And it's also a wonderful opportunity uh, because if you treat that consumer right uh, during in bad times, their, uh, sure. in bad times, the loyalty that you can build is, is, Tremendous, tremendous. Yeah, so that makes really, so much sense. Yeah, we're working very closely with some institutions on pairing their first-party data, which they can do because those consumers have opted in, with the the plethora of data that we have in the in the third-party or post-charge-off space to really kind of um, extract signals that will help that en- enterprise and that institution. Uh, to, to sort of personalize their outreach and, and, and timing of how they approach a delinquent consumer. Yeah. So. Well, I'm excited to, to watch you grow this thing. I'm super bullish on it. I love learning as much as possible. It's, um, it's incredible how these businesses come up and you're like, ah, oh, that makes perfect sense. And it, it is an obvious solution. Um, but I'm curious because you've you're probably you know drinking from the fire hose and really busy. Like, how do you? You mentioned hobbies. How do you relax or find time for hobbies? Well, these days I'm trying to keep fit. You know, I, I am getting on in age. Uh, I, I am approaching you know 59 years old, so I'm getting on in age. I want to keep fit. Um, I can't go to the uh, you know the club uh, fitness club anymore. So I I'm now a subscriber of Peloton. Uh, so I'm doing my weightlifting with Peloton. Nice. Uh, Are you, do you I have the bike? Also, I don't have the bike. I'm doing weights. Oh, okay. I'm doing weights. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And then uh, I've gotten into fly fishing because uh, I felt like, you know, how do I isolate? I'm also an avid boater. So I have a boat here on Lake Washington and all through the summer, I would, I would basically quarantine on the boat. I just go from my condo here to the boat and then drop the hook in the middle of the lake and just isolate there. I started thinking, where else, where else can I isolate? That is wonderful. You know, we live in the mecca of, you know, outdoors. Uh, so I started taking up fly fishing and I That's would take so a ride. Cool. And what about Mexico? Where do you fit Mexico in? Where in Mexico is your place? So we are in a little town called Puerto Aventuras. It's about an hour south of Cancun. It's on the Riviera Maya. Uh, it's it's about thirty minutes from a new hot little town called Tulum. A lot of people are. I love. Uh, I, I mean, I love the idea. Oh my gosh! Yes. Yeah. So it's you know we have a beautiful place right on the ocean, uh, which is the Caribbean. Mexico down there is a lot more cultural. There's a lot more European and Canadian tourism. Uh, so we feel it's got a whole different feel to it than, let's say, Cabo or Puerto Vallarta. Uh, the people are wonderful. The Mayan culture is wonderful down there. Uh, you have jungle. You have, you know, beautiful Caribbean ocean. And we haven't been able to get down there. You know, we were we were scheduled uh, for our typical vacation as a family on the 3rd of December, and we canceled. Um, so don't know when we're going to get down there. Unfortunately, Mexico is uh, no better uh, as it relates to you know, regulation and, and adhering to, you know, rules of, of masking and things of that nature. Yeah. So you know, I, I, I'm married to a surgical nurse. So you can imagine what my life is like uh, yeah. you know, working with a surgical nurse. Uh, and, you know, we have a very high bar of compliance and, and uh, you know, keeping healthy. So, yeah, well, that makes sense. Hawaii could be a good option. I think that they're being pretty compliant and you need a COVID test to even enter. Um, so I have some friends who have been going there, but, or you could just, I don't even know, get one of those sun lights that gives you, I mean, the the vitamin D that we need and that we're lacking. I have one. one. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. It's good for the mood. And so how do you set yourself up, uh, for a good week outside of staying fit? Do you have any sort of rituals or 
kind of morning routines? Um, you know, I, I, I'm pretty much on 24 seven with the business. Uh, so, uh, I, I like to, um, you know, take time out, uh, at the end of the day and do my, my fitness. I'm trying to do this every day when I can, I do yoga off of uh, Peloton. So that helps with stress. And that's great. I did yoga on Peloton this morning, Dennis Morton. He's a good, he's a good, uh, he's a good instructor. So that sounds like your approach to self-care because I know that it's a big, um, subject always, but especially right now, given the state of our country, our world, and also just given the stress of being an entrepreneur. Um, so that's the self-care, the, the working out, the yoga. Yes. The fly, you know, fishing. Unfortunately, I don't fly fishing when I can now, now, you know, the weather's not, not uh, conducive for that. So, you know, it's really a case of uh, how do I keep the balance? And, you know, as yeah. a team, what we try to do is we, you know, we schedule a happy hour every week uh, where it's sort of, you know, we just get on and there's a uh, strict rule, no business, don't talk business. It's a matter of just commingling and uh, trying to, you know, bring new employees into the team and, and get to know one another. You know, like first week a new employee joins, they have nothing but one-on-ones with everybody. Uh, and it's really That's mostly great. about getting to learn who they are and not talking business about what they do, but mostly who they are as people. Yeah. You know, w- yeah. one principle we have at Attunely is, you know, we recognize that we spend more time with one another as co- co-workers than we do with our significant others, our children, anybody else who means a lot to yeah. us. And it's really important to build that human connection and, and understand who that person is and what's, what's their, you know, personal motivations, professional motivations, what makes them tick, you know, because we're spending yeah. so much time together. It sounds great. It sounds like you're a phenomenal leader who leads with your heart and with empathy and just thinking about the overall human, not just kind of bottom line, what can you do for me? Um, and that's awesome. That's yeah, going to well, create a very sticky culture and going to set you up for success because obviously happy employees make happy, uh, make the customers happy. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And you know, we're, we're, we're very, we take great pride in, you know, so, some of the recognition we just got from built in Seattle about that. And really for me, you know, maybe it's uh, my age and the fact that I've been through so many different experiences in enterprise and startup that, you know, I really try to keep this in perspective. Like we have a we have a, a vision and a mission here, but we're not curing cancer or trying to figure out a you know vaccination for for coronavirus. Um, and we put it into perspective, and and uh, we we have respect for one another, and and I think yeah, that that, that, that just grows. And an interesting statistic yeah. that came up yesterday was the average age of our employees is forty four years old. Oh, interesting. Isn't that interesting. That is interesting. So maybe that that might have something to do with it as well. Right. Yeah. People who have made the very deliberate choice to work there, given they've probably got lots of options. Um, wow. That says a lot about Attunely. That's awesome. So my ultimate yeah. question uh, for you, Scott, is what fuels you? What fuels me? Um, solving problems that uh, are multi-constituent problems. Uh, that's what we're doing here at Attunely. You know, like debt collection is not is not a new sort of, uh, not a new concept. You know, it's been around for 40, 50 years. Some of these customers that we serve are fourth generation collection agencies. So when you think about the ecosystem uh, and how much actual consumer debt exists every year, um, what really fuels me is the fact that we are helping almost every constituent in the value chain. We're helping financial institutions who actually extend credit and have a cost of credit that is a direct result of the of the uh, degree of a delinquency that they experience every year and the cost of servicing that delinquency. Uh, we're we're solving problems for everybody in the call center who, you know, are trying to find ways to connect with consumers. And, and obviously consumers are more mobile these days. Um, and we're, we're finding better ways to outreach to consumers and, and affording them those communication modalities. We're helping collection agencies who, 
you know, have been handicapped with, with the data that they actually have on their servers, but haven't been able to use to, to really make decisions on where they deploy their precious resources to try to recover the most revenue for their clients and satisfy their clients. And then ultimately, we're solving a, a huge problem for consumers, right? Because consumers on average yeah. have three to, three to four debts that they're, they're juggling and it's stressful in their life and they really would like to sort of retire the debt. Uh, but they they don't have the tools or they don't have the uh, intelligence, not intellectual quotient intelligence, but let's say information. Yeah, the access to, to, to make, even know. To make trade-off right. decisions. And, and, you know, ultimately I feel like, you know, we could put the power in the hands of the consumers to manage their own debt across multiple uh, creditors. And when you think holistically about that whole value chain, there's so many problems in the value chain that we believe uh, through dynamic scoring, think of it like dynamic financial health scoring, it, uh, it en enables creditors and, and debtors to really interact in a much more uh, mutually respectful way and uh, productive way. Yeah, we could use more of that. And as much as you're saying you're not uh, curing cancer, which you're not, but you're also not selling widgets. You really are making a mark and and something very positive for the economy and for just like humankind as far as um, how we treat one another. So um, I'm just super grateful that you agreed to be on the podcast and I love getting to know you better and I'm wishing you much success. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the feedback and I really do appreciate the personal approach. Uh, I think it's really nice. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest news and episodes. You can also contact us at podcast at fueltalent.com to provide feedback, ask questions, and share topics or guests you would like us to cover in the future. We hope you feel inspired by our guests and that we have helped fuel your day. Join us next time for another episode of What Fuels You.